We are now going to turn our attention to Australia and to address us about this is Professor Bob Gregory who spoke with us briefly yesterday. Professor Gregory has held positions at the University of Melbourne, London School of Economics, Australian National University, Industries Assistance Commission, Northwestern University and visiting positions at Harvard and the University of Chicago and the University College in London. He has been closely involved in the analysis and development of Australian economic policy. He's been a member of the Board of Management at the Australian Institute of <coughs> Family Studies, principal consultant in a series of government aged care reviews, member of the committee that recommended the introduction of student income contingent loans, member of the Board of the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Australian Sciences and Technology Council. Please welcome Bob Gregory, ladies and gentlemen. I, um, th this, I was asked to talk about the success of the Australian reforms uh, and I refused to do that. Um, and, and, and the reason why I refused to do that is something I think which you all should, should bear in mind and that is that defining success is not straightforward. Right? That is, uh, people interested in reform have different ideas of success. Uh, if you're in the finance department, you just want to save money. Uh, if you're a recipient of wealth, you have a completely different idea of that success. Success may well be how you, you were treated and so on. Right? So I, I didn't want to do success. Uh, and the second reason why I didn't want to do success is that my judgment is that the reforms have got a long way to go. Now that's not a statement of need for reform. That's a statement I just think governments are going to go much further down the reform process. So, you know, to talk about it as a success is almost as though it's sort of over in some sense. I just think it's just beginning, both here in New Zealand, but in other countries. So I don't want to talk about success. Uh, the other thing you should know is that um, I'm very much a top-down person. So my contribution is I sort of know the big numbers so if you want to talk about welfare, I talk about uh, two million people. I don't talk about an individual. So, you, so that's un inevitably going to affect what I say. But that doesn't matter. That just means that you don't listen to me alone. You know, you've got to put me in context with everybody else. Uh, I also thought that I would talk about what I have learned because I've been working on these big picture numbers for about ten years or so, and you get dispirited, uh, you know, you, every step forward you seem to know less. But, I, but when I wrote down what I learned, it sort of went on and on and on, I got really excited. So I, I prepared a two hour speech, uh, which doesn't look quite right now. So the slides will be coming past fairly quickly, so I'll be jumping to things, right? and I'll try and focus on the, the big deal. This picture, I think, is really very important because it underlies a lot of what's going on. This picture is Australia, but it could be New Zealand. In fact, Paul, I think, showed the same sort of picture for the UK. And it explains why I think reform is going to go on and on and on. I mean, this is a remarkable picture in a number of ways. I mean, the first way it's remarkable is I take everybody on income support between 15 and 64 and divide them by the number of people on income support. If you walked around Australia in 1966 and stopped every man between 15 and 19 and said, are you on income support? You'd have to, by and large, talk to, oh, I don't know, 30 people before a guy would say, yes, I am. If you did that in the peak of 1993 or thereabouts, you would walk around the streets and roughly speaking every fifth man would say, yes, I am. I mean, that's just an enormous change, right? In fact, if you decided that you were in the marriage market and you're going to marry a woman between 15 and 19 and you want a high-flying executive type, then in, 1990, in 2001, you keep asking these women, you, know, you want to clear out the welfare support ones, right, because they don't look a good buy. And basically, one in four of the women would say, I'm on welfare support. 
and she probably wouldn't want me anyway, right? But one in four is quite a remarkable number. So you can see why society as a whole is edgy about this. I mean, if that had continued, I mean, so suppose you do what economists often do and draw lines through things and projected it, then we'd, we'd, we'd all be on welfare support at some very soon, right? So that's quite important. The other thing that you can see, I think, that's important here is women are on different programs than men, by and large. Women are on loan parent programs, men are on disability, uh, women are on caring type programs. Doesn't really matter for these numbers, right? They go up together. Whatever's happening to men is happening to women. The levels are different, but they're going up. The other thing you can see is that it took basically 40 years to get to the peak. So that means that it's going to have to be very radical reform to bring numbers down quickly. Right? If we come down at roughly the same rate we went up, we're talking about a 40 year scenario. Okay? And I guess the other lesson that you learn from this is that recently the going up has been unemployment associated. You know, you can see the 91 recession, right? Uh, and you can see the, the slowdown in 2000. But basically, something happened around the world between 1975 and 1981. I mean, the New Zealand picture looks like this, the Australian picture looks like this, the UK picture looks like this. So you have to have a theory as well about what went on in this period. Right? Because, you know, when you get things down, you don't always have to know the past, but it's useful to know what went on. And the last thing I want to say is that that picture, you should say to me, well, if one in four women are involved in income support at the peak, is it sensible just to think about income support alone? I mean, you know, should you be, shouldn't you be thinking about the labour market as well? You know, shouldn't you be thinking about other things? And so you don't want to make the mistake of thinking about income support alone. For example, suppose I said I'm going to put all those women to work in the next year, then you've got to find work for one in every fourth woman. I mean, it's just not possible, right? So you have to put things together and you'll see that this was in the past associated with deteriorations in the labour market. And then you get into this very complicated analysis about what comes first. You know, are, are you looking here at what's going on for the labour market for unskilled men? Is that what's generating this? Or is it that what you're looking at here is more generous programs available from 1975 which stop the unskilled men going to work? The two extremes. Or some combination. So you have to tie it into the labour market.